Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. I know, again, everybody is from all over the place, but hello. Good to see all of your wonderful and smiling faces. We're going to give it just a few more minutes while people continue to roll into the Zoom room. And then, of course, we will begin with a little bit of housekeeping, and then we will go straight into our wonderful talk today. Sarah, are we going to have sharks? Are we going to have dancing sharks in the presentation no. today? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> no, we're not allowed because we're a company, so we're not allowed to use uh, Katy Perry's likeness. Um, so we had to we had to uh, uh, record some original material for you guys. Um, so I, yeah, I got my manager to do a silly dance. Um, so yeah, it's all original content this this time. So <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So I'll probably give it one more minute before we start. Those of you who are students, please remember who are enrolled in actual electrical engineering 19, please make sure to turn on your camera. So we're not just talking to a bunch of names on a screen. We do appreciate it, but please make sure to also keep yourself muted um, so that we don't disturb our speaker as they are giving their talk. But it is wonderful to see you all again back here. Uh, every time we open up the room, I always feel like I should begin with like my game show, like host announcer voice, just like, hello, and welcome to another episode of Fiat Lux. I'm your host, Action Jackson, and then we should just go from there. I hear like the Price is Right theme music in my head. For those of you who are old enough to remember watching the Price is Right, I used to watch with my Nana, um, where I learned how much the price of a washer and dryer really is <laughs> every day. Um, but again, good to see all of you. So it's about 12.02 and we have, I think the majority of people in here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and give you guys some quick housekeeping like we normally do. And then we will go ahead and begin our talk. So can you all see my screen? Just thumbs up if you're able to see it, thank you. All right, so just so you all know, students who are enrolled in Electrical Engineering 19 for a pass or no pass grade, you are required to attend at least eight seminars, which does include our bonus lectures. And we'll talk a little bit more about bonus lectures in just a few moments, but eight seminars. So there's 12 total throughout the quarter, including the two that just passed. So you should be able to make all eight, hopefully. If you have any issues attending, please let us know. Um, and then submit parts one and two of the final assignment, uh, which is a one page report on your favorite lecture and the cubic comparison sheet. Now these are not due weekly or anything. They are due uh, probably May 31st. So towards the end of the quarter after all of the talks have concluded. I did have some questions about how we know who has attended the session and who has not. Uh, Zoom compiles a report after each session that is accessible to the host, which is me, which I then compare to the class roster. And I see how long you were in session. So it tells me who registered, how long you spent in the waiting room and then how long you spent in session. And hopefully you spend more than 30 minutes in the session because we only have an hour. So you should be here for more than the allotted amount of class time. Um, this, I do add up all the minutes. If you have to leave and come back and leave and come back, don't worry. I don't just stop at like the time you were in for two minutes and then never visit it again. As long as all your times add up to more than 30 minutes in session, we are absolutely okay. So please make sure that you are here. Today, we do have Sarah Campbell's favorite qubit, which is trapped ions. And then uh, two updates. I know I told you in the beginning that we would be having, or pop, there would be the possibility of having a in-person session. No worries, the session will be virtual, but we have Abe Asphalt uh, for superconductors next week. And then a bonus section that we have is going to be uh, Dr. Mattel uh, Desjardins. Mm, I said it 47 times this morning. My French is horrible. So Desjarda, Clarice will fix it if it's wrong, but Mattel, Matu, Matu will be speaking on May 17th at 12 p.m. So that is a bonus lecture. And again, next week's will be virtual. All of these lectures will be virtual sessions. Okay, so no worries about that. Um, recordings and other...
If there is a, a discrepancy between the name that you just saw on the slide and the name on Brew and Learn, I will go ahead and address that this afternoon. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, recordings and other resources. So we have a QR code here. This is a link tree. So it provides links to the registration, past recordings and lecturer slides. Now, as far as lecturer slides are concerned, please know that we are at the whim of our speakers, our speakers who are graduate students, professors, um, industry employees. So we get the slides whenever they are able to send them to us. And we have reached out for follow-up. I know you are all waiting on Hunter slides. He does have to make some corrections to them, but they should be coming. And as soon as they do, I will be sure to update them and let you all know that they have been updated. But if you scan this link, QR link on your phone or are able to copy and paste the link into your browser. This should send you to all of the places in which we have all of our resources. So please make sure to go ahead and check that link, check the Canvas for those of you or Brew and Learn as you all call it um, and double check back with us. And we will, all, we will try to address all of your emails and questions um, as they come through. Other questions I see in the chat. Whatever you see on Brew and Learn takes priority. So the professor has spoken. So that is what it will be, all right? And lastly, I am very happy today because we will be having a fantastic talk given by Sarah Campbell talking about her favorite qubit, which is trapped ions. So that concludes the housekeeping. Again, if you are a student, please turn on your camera. If you are able, make sure you mute yourselves. Um, Dr. Campbell has requested that you hold the questions until the end of each section. So after each section, she will call for questions. And then if you have some, please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask those questions. So Sarah, I will be turning it over to you. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to have you and the floor is yours. Thanks, Jackson. Alrighty, can everyone see this? Great, how do I close this? Hi, okay. Can I like just get rid of this? Perhaps not, okay. Here we go. All right. Can everyone uh, see and hear me? Okay. Yeah, hopefully. Um, okay. Yes, uh, so yes. hi yeah, awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks so much for um having me back. Um great to be here. Thanks, thanks to um Jackson and Clarice for organizing. Um so yeah, my name is Sarah Campbell. Um yeah, you can just call me Sarah. Um I'm currently working at Continuum. Uh, in the commercial products group. And today I'm going to talk about my favorite qubit, which is trapped ions. All right, so yeah, recently, actually the two companies, um, Cambridge Quantum Computing and uh, the Quantum Computing Division of Honeywell came together to form um, a new startup called, yeah, Continuum. And so, um, just here's just a quick overview. I'm at the location in Broomfield, Colorado. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a probably like 400 person company now. There's locations all over, all over the world. Um, some of us, especially like at the Broomfield and Golden Valley um, locations in, in the States are working on um, like hardware. Uh, so like next generation physical quantum computers. We also have some theorists and yeah, there's tons of um, really amazing like theorists and math. Um, mathematicians working on more like applications oriented solutions, um, more on the Cambridge quantum side. Um, so yeah, we have uh, rolled out this H series of quantum computers. So they're um, quantum commercial quantum computers based on trapped ions. And so this model H1 has already been released. Um, it's in production. People are um, running jobs over the cloud as we speak. And um, I'm working on yeah, model H2, so the next generation system. We're currently um, putting it together, uh, getting everything all sort of like calibrated up, writing a bunch of code to get it all um, working properly. And so in, in particular, uh, I am working on ion transport around, so it's like sort of a racetrack design. And um, I am responsible uh, for computing all the waveforms that uh, sort of take our, take our ions around the racetrack get the ions to talk to the right ions, et cetera. So that's sort of what I do um, lately on a daily basis. So with that, um, yeah, just here's like the overview of my talk. So I'm gonna start um, with just a brief review of qubits and quantum computing uh, before I get into more of what I do, which is ion trapping and uh, 
wrapped around quantum computing. Then I'll talk about my career path a bit, and I should have time for questions. So just, just for an intro, you know, Richard Feynman, one of the greatest, uh, you know, teachers of physics, uh, prided himself on being able to devise ways to explain even the most profound ideas to beginning students. And I know this lecture is sort of supposed to be aimed at freshmen. And so when Richard Feynman um, went and tried to prepare a freshman lecture on quantum mechanics, he, he came back and said, I couldn't do it. I couldn't reduce it to the freshman level. That means we don't really understand it. And so I would say like in most physics talks you'll end up going to, like there might be bits you don't understand. And it's usually like on the speaker, like maybe the speaker doesn't actually understand things well enough to um, distill it into like an intuitive explanation. And um, so, yeah, if you don't understand things, I, I, I'd say it's, it's probably, probably my fault. So don't feel bad and feel free to ask. And so first I'm just gonna start with qubits. So, you know, quantum bits, um, and I'm sure you know, like bits can be either a zero or a one. And so first I'm gonna talk about, yeah, the two cool things I think that um, qubits provide us, which is like the ability to do superposition and they also like have an inherent phase. So when we write out uh, the full quantum state of a particular qubit, um, you'll see it's gonna be a superposition of this zero state here and this one state here. And it's like both at the same time. And so I like to think of it as like a coin that you've tossed. It might be like uh, an unfair coin, but it's, it's up, it's, it's in the air, it's flipping around. It hasn't landed yet, basically. And so this term in front of the zero, that basically tells you how much of it, um, you know, how, how weighted towards heads is it? How likely is it to land heads? And this term in front of the one is like how likely it is to, to eventually land as tails. And then this interesting phase term, it's like the relative phase between the zero state and the one state. I usually think of it like, okay, yeah, the, the coin hasn't landed yet. It's just kind of like going around in circles. Um, and that's sort of like what the phase, what the phase is doing as it's flipping around, maybe it'll go by, um, go by your face and you're gonna see heads, tails, heads, tails. And it's sort of like the rate at which, um, yeah, the coin is processing. And so um, generally, so you sort of represent the, the superposition by this um, angle of theta, and you represent the phase phi. And so um, basically there's this full state, you can, you can think of it as uh, basically all the possible states uh, for a single qubit are gonna map to the surface of a sphere where the North Pole is heads, and then the South Pole is tails. And so if you think about what, what, what happens right here around the equator, that's when you're in an equal superposition between heads and tails. And um, yeah, I think your, your longitude then is basically like this phase phi, um, which sort of tells you the relative phase between, um, you know, your the zero state and the one state. And so a little more on this phase, um, the phase is actually going to uh, evolve in time uh, proportional to the energy difference between the two states. Um, so just for an illustration, you can see Bryce here on the left, he has more energy and his phase is evolving more quickly. Uh, Justin here has less energy and uh, his phase is evolving um, much more slowly. And uh, I think he's also sort of struggling with uh, his environment and uh, he's also kind of like decohering. And so, um, yeah, for our qubits at Quantinium, our qubits are based on uh, ytterbium atoms. And we choose those because they're really, they come from nature um, and they're really like nature's, nature's perfect qubits. So if you recall, um, yeah, when you have an atom, uh, you know, you have your positively charged nucleus in the middle. And uh, if you remember from like chemistry class or whatever, the electrons, um, the electron configurations uh, can only occupy like certain discrete states. And so one electron configuration, we call that the zero state and like the other electron configuration, we call that the one state. And so uh, to be more specific, we're, um, you know, our, our zero and one states are gonna be two hyperfine um, hyperfine levels in the ground state. And so why do we use atoms? Yeah, they're 
each atom as it pops out from nature, it is fundamentally identical. Um, yeah, we can store quantum information in these really long lived um, different electronic states. And we can actually use lasers. So if we give this atom a photon, where like the photon is just the right energy to be able to bridge that energy gap between the zero and the one, it can make it flip from a zero to a one. Um, the atom also like can see like the, the phase of the, um, of the laser beams that were shining on, on it. So we can do a lot of like different manipulations, addressing, entanglement, measurement. Um, we do all that actually using lasers. And all the errors here are really fundamentally understood because like an atom is something like simple enough that um, you know physics can treat it uh, rather completely. And so I think that, yeah, we understand everything about the qubit. And the remaining challenge is basically engineering the environment engineering our knobs we have um, to be able to talk to these qubits so we're able to like capture control and manipulate them. So, you know, how do we start doing that? Well, the first thing is we got to trap one. Um, so I'm going to talk now about um, ion trapping and get into some specifics. Um, I probably have time to take a few questions about um, qubits or, or quantum computing in general um, if people have them. Okay, I'll move on, but feel free. Oh, yeah, go for it. No, it was me. Go for it, go for it. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if, if something comes up, like, yeah, you can probably interrupt. I just want to make sure I get to the end of the talk. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to talk about ion trapping. So this is an actual photograph um, of an ion trap. The ions sort of hover just above the surface of this trap. Um, and so let's zoom in right here. So the first step is we got to load an ion. So we launch a neutral atom. There's a little hole on the backside. And we launch a neutral atom through that hole. Then we uh, ionize the atom with the laser. So like laser comes in with just the right energy to rip an electron off. And so now we have a positively charged atom. And now that it's charged, we can use a combination of alternating and uh, static uh, electric fields then to um, trap the ion. And when you think of it being trapped, it's sort of like, like uh, all, all the electric fields sort of conspire to make this little like, it's kind of like uh, the, the ion like sits in a little container in a, um, like the, the container that like eggs come in or whatever, like a little egg crate or whatever. Um, it sits in this little cup and we can actually move that little cup around. So for example, um, if I want to move the ion over here, um, I can tune. So these these like little squares um, represent DC electrodes. So there's like all these different electrodes I can put different voltages on them. And that's how I control uh, where the ions are and like what they're doing. Um, and so it's a positively charged atom. So for example, I put, if I just put in a, a negative voltage down here, that will kind of like attract the ion over. And that's how I just like shuttle ions all around my trap. And so that's kind of what I do on the day to day is I compute um, all these like arbitrary waveforms to like shuttle, swap, move, move all these ions around. And so once you get the ion into like what we call a gate zone, you can shine the laser on the ion. And here, you know, I took it from, um, you know, pointing up at the North Pole, then now it's a superposition between the zero and one states. And another important thing, um, for quantum computing is entanglement. So it's basically when you get a couple of ions together um, and you manipulate them so that even later when you bring them apart, um, their quantum states are gonna be like fundamentally linked and dependent on each other. And I think that really helps us, um, you know, be able to run the quantum algorithms because like you're leveraging the fact that, you know, there's this other ion that's on the other side of the trap, you're not really messing with it, but you like, by manipulating like this other ion that it talked to in the past, you're like automatically um, changing its state. And so here to be, to be able to entangle two of these qubits, we actually merge their two potentials. So we hold them together in a single cup and then we shine lasers on them at just the right frequency. Um, 
and I'll get I'll get to more of the details of that in a minute. But after we do the gates, after we entangle the two ions, we then can reseparate them and then transport them to go interact with other ions. So there's a way to hide this. I can put it here. Um, yeah, so here's like sort of like what it means to be entangled. So um, when we write out, um, this is like what, what uh, the state of like two ions together will look like when they're entangled. And so you write it like this, where the first number here is what qubit A is doing. And the second number here is what qubit B is doing. So you can see they're in a superposition, but it's not like each ion is like independently in its own superposition. They're really like, they're linked. So like when this qubit is a zero, the other qubit has to be a zero. When this qubit's a one, the other qubit has to be a one. And this is sort of like what we mean by entanglement, um, where like you can't write this mathematically as like something that the two ions are doing independently. It's really like, you know, they're really like linked together. I hide this. Nah. Okay. Um, so yeah, what it looks like here is in dance form. Um, here, we're kind of like wiggling together because we're two ions in the same well right now, you know, and they're both charged. So they feel each other's like Coulomb interactions. And so that's kind of like why we're wiggling our hips back and forth because we can still feel each other's motion in the state. But yeah, as you can see, every time my hands are up, um, Bryce's hands are also up. And then uh, we force the managers to do it too. Um, this is basically the same thing, but that just phase terms a bit, just different. Um, so again, they're either both up or both down. At the same time. And if I'm ever going to like measure what one over here is doing, um, I measure him that might project him into like an upstate. If I go over and look at Justin, he's always going to match. Um, and so, yeah, over here, this is like the other, other one of the entangled states. Um, here, it's, it's, we're opposite. So every time Bryce is up, I'm down. Every time Bryce is down, I'm up. And similarly, this last uh, state, um, it's the same thing except that the phase term is a little bit different. And so again, all together, um, these are sort of the four maximally entangled states um, for, for two ions. And you can see like they're, they're all just like dancing together. And so how do you get entangled? Well, we do what's called a molmer sorensen gate. Um, and that is a gate that takes these four states that you can see on the left. These four states are not entangled and it brings them um, to these entangled states. And so we will have these two uh, ions. They're sitting next to each other in the track, kind of like jiggling together. They feel each other's um, Coulomb forces because they're both charged. Um, and then lasers come in and they give like a, a spin dependent force. So depending on whether the qubit's pointing up or down, the laser's gonna jiggle them around in a different way. And so because the laser's jiggling them around depending on their spin state and because they can feel each other's motion, um, it's really like through the motion that um, the ions can get their um, qubit states to be entangled. Um, and so what it looks like is somewhat like this. So I'll go through this whole table. So if we start off in the one, one state, so we're both kind of bouncing around and then this laser guy comes in, he's giving us the same force because we're both pointed up. So then after, um, you know, we're entangled, but we're bouncing up and down sort of synchronously um, after, after we get shot with the lasers. So we start in the one zero state, the laser is going to come in and it's a spin dependent force again. So we're gonna feel kind of different forces. And then once we get entangled, um, we're gonna be going sort of in opposite directions, but this is still entangled because every time I'm up, Bryce is down. So our electronic states are like, you know, forever more intertwined, I guess. Um, similarly, if we're down up and this is our laser guy comes in, shines, shines the laser at us, that will bring us um, to this zero one minus one zero. And finally, we start in zero zero, so we're both Pointing down. Um, yep. And then we, we talk to each other through our hips, I would say. Um, so we, we kind of like sense each other's motion 
and then we kind of coordinate to, to dance together. Um, and so, yeah, it's like that, and then you can bring us to different parts of the island shop and stuff, but we'll still have that memory of like how our spins are always gonna, you know, flip um, either together or opposite. And so um, physically when, um, you know, when we run what's called like a quantum circuit, um, a quantum circuit is basically like, you know, uh, they're gonna tell the compiler or whatever is gonna tell us like, okay, I want you to like do this set of gates, these sets of gates with like these, pairs of ions and then tell me what the answer is at the end. So we'll start here. You can do a, um, one cubic gates on like say these two ions, um, put them into superposition states. And then let's say I want to entangle the red ion and the green ion. So first I have to bring that green ion over so it can sit in the same well as the red ion and jiggle around together. Um, and then we do that two cubic gate like I was showing before. Um, and so, yeah, because they're right next to each other, because they're charged, um, you can kind of use their motion to get them um, to talk to each other. And now, see, I want to do, I want to entangle the red ion with the blue ion. So I gotta swap that one over and then I can shuttle it so it can be next to its friend over there. Um, then I do another two cubic gate, entangle those, Say that's it, and I just want to measure. I want to see what my answer was. Um, when we measure, uh, you know, we, we have to measure at the end of the day if the qubit's in the zero state or the one state. Um, and for one of those states, if we hit it with a laser, it will glow, and for the other state, it won't. Um, so we hit it with a laser, see if it glows or not, and like that's basically our answer. And so this is actually a video of real ions in our traps. You see, we shuttle that guy over, we combine them into the same well. Here we split them again, combine them again, split it. We're just kind of showing different things. And you can shuttle it back over there, for example. Um, yeah, that's actually like a real video with real, real ions that you're seeing right there. And also for the swap, um, here you can see that's kind of what it looks like. If you need this ion to go that way, you first have to get it on the other side of the original ion. So you do something like, so it looks like this. And so again, like why do we do all this uh, ion transport? Why am I computing all these waveforms all day? Um, ion transport actually allows us to get sort of like arbitrary connectivity in our circuits. So if we decide like, oh, I want, you know, qubit 10 to like gate with uh, qubit three, or whatever, it's gonna be like um, a series of transport steps that can make that happen. And I can get that connectivity that I want without having to actually, um, you know, move around physical wires. So like in contrast, if you consider a classical NAND gate um, made out of transistors, so like your inputs would be like these voltages A and B, and your output would be this voltage Q. And so basically um, if, a and B are both high, you want um, the Q to be low because it's not and, um, and otherwise, um, otherwise Q would be high. And so you can see like to, to get like bits A and B to like talk to each other and um, produce an output bit Q, um, you know, these are actually physical wires and like physical components they are actually physically connected. Um, and so like, you know, if you want to rewire it to like, uh, you know, do it, do a different um, circuit, uh, you'd actually have to go in and like physically move iron uh, wires around, which is like, you know, pretty hard if you're a cat and it's like really hard for, <laughs> for like people like me too. Cause um, you know, I think uh, like some other quantum computing architectures too, I feel like you'd have to like re refabricate like the whole, basically the whole chip or whatever versus like, with ions, um, yeah, to change your circuit connectivity, it's, it's really just as simple as, um, you know, we have we have this basic set of, of basic transports and it's just as simple as like running um, a certain set of, of pre-computed transports and you can just like get that connectivity that you want. And yeah, another thing is uh, we can do, we have a lot of parallel independent zones. So we can do a lot of this gating um, in parallel 
makes for pretty pictures. We're, we're shining in all these laser beams to all the different heat zones simultaneously. Um, and it also you know, helps us uh, execute algorithms more quickly. And so this is sort of what, um, you know, in the lab, here's a sort of schematic of, of how it looks in the lab. And at the heart of the system is the ions right here. Um, and they're in the middle of an ultra high vacuum chamber. We even have like some cryogenic cooling as well. Uh, yeah, and they're sitting here. And then we have like layers and layers sort of around the ions. Um, so outside of the vacuum chamber, um, we have, you know, all the lasers come in here and get shot at the ions. Um, here's the detection is below it. We have all these control electronics um, that help us both like help us with the um, electrodes. So we program all the voltages to do all the ion rearrangement. Um, the electronics also talk to the lasers and like turn all the lasers on and off um, just at the right time. And then eventually just get connected up to some cloud interface. Um, that customers are then able to connect to. And so basically whatever kind of engineer you are, um, we definitely have a role for you. Like, so we have software engineers and IT folks um, sort of take care of like these layers of the full stack. So, um, you know, they'll be programming like Python interfaces um, for the control electronics. So like, you know, people like me, like I don't know how to program FPGAs, but um, I can talk to a lot of these things over like a fairly simple um, Python interface, but like, yeah, a lot of them are also like sort of in the weeds, like programming um, sort of like real time FPGA controllers, uh, et cetera. Um, we have a lot of electrical engineers also who work on the control electronics and also especially our RF and DC signals. Um, you know, they, they have to be like really high bandwidth, but like really low noise. And, um, you know, we need to con computer control them uh, with very like high um, fidelity. Um, also we have optical engineers who, um, you know, get, get all the lasers working and get them all at the right um, frequencies, make them like really low noise, whatever we need um, for that particular operation. Um, and we also have lens design folks who are working on delivering the, the light to the ions um, and also collecting light from the ions. And then also um, a lot of these things, well, like they need to keep those lasers aligned to the ions to within like a few hundred nanometers. So it's also really great to have a lot of really good um, mechanical engineering support, uh, both for like passive stability and also for like, um, helping us with like the actuators so we can uh, maintain active, active alignment. Yeah, so that was it for the ions portion. Um, any questions? Sarah, there's a question in the chat. Uh, Nazanin is asking, what's the coherence time that you can manipulate trapped ions? What does it depend on? What does it depend on? That's a really great question. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it depends on, I mean, Trapped ions, let's see, uh, you know, I, they can stay coherent in a coherent superposition um, of those two quantum states for like, you know, many seconds for sure. Um, and what limits that I think is nothing really fundamental. I would say um, for us, it's probably, you know, as we're shuttling them around and stuff right now, it's like our ability to, um, you know, track, that phase as, as we shuttle the ions around or as like various like environmental um, perturbations um, come in and, and mess with that qubit frequency. So like, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, you put it in a superposition and that phase that accumulates is gonna depend on the energy difference between the two states. Um, but there's a lot of environmental uh, perturbations that can affect um, that, that energy difference between the two states. And for us, a, a major one is just like magnetic fields. Um, but yeah, right now I think we're like more at a point where we're just trying to like, uh, you know, track and compensate for that. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's anything like super fundamental there yet. I mean, like after all, you know, people, you know, some of the best atomic clocks in the world are based on, um, you know, based on trapped ions and like, you know, they obviously like 
interrogate those ions for, for a really long time. And Sarah, just because that's something yeah. that they're looking into, right? So how many gates can you can you perform before they cohere, more or less? Yeah, that's a good question too. So um, obviously right now, like in my role, I am like just building, building it up so we can like, uh, you know, get all the wires connected and like, um, you know, bring our system to launch. So I can't really comment on my system because it's still being like assembled. Um, but I would say like, uh, yeah, I, I would point to like some of our more recent like quantum volume demonstrations uh, where I feel like you, you have to get um, most of the ions you have to gate with like all the other ions basically um, to demonstrate this. And so I think to pass quantum volume, what did they do? 1024, 2048, that's not quite my system. But um, yeah, I think it's like, basically like two to the eight, two to the nine. It's like like eight to 10 layers um, of two qubit gates, I believe. Um, I'll, I'll submit a correction if I'm, if I'm wrong about that. And, and um, now that you yeah, mentioned, yeah. I, I don't think you're familiar with the terminology uh, quantum volume. Can you, can you spend like 10 seconds explaining? Yeah, yeah. I like to think of it as like, I don't know, sort of similar to the H index or something where like, you know, like um, it's not enough to just have like, a gajillion qubits and it's also like not enough to be able to do like a gajillion gates basically like um it's like it's like a okay-ish metric of like describing your quantum uh sorry your quantum computer's performance in terms of like you know the number it's basically the, the number of qubits uh it's, it's like two to the number of qubits um where you can like basically entangled that number of qubits with like every other qubit. I think that's a reasonable way to put it. So like if your gate fidelity, for example, if your gate fidelity isn't like terribly good, um, if you add another qubit, you will not be able to entangle that extra qubit with everybody else before, um, before everything's just like a noisy, um, incoherent mess. So it's basically like, yeah, every qubit you want, you, you want to add to your machine, you have to make sure you can like, entangle it with with everybody else and that sort of gives you the the number um the uh the number of qubits you can like make a maximally entangled state with that's not quite the definition but like i think that sort of captures you know captures the the spirit of it uh, may i also ask a question here uh -huh. i may also ask a question Go ahead, go ahead, Avazot. Ah, okay. Go ahead. Uh, when you're shuffling and swapping ions, so of course you are having excitations, I guess at, at least emotional excitations. When you increase the number of ions, how do you actually deal with this problem? And the second part of my question is, what is the heating rate in your trap currently? And how do you improve that really? Right, yeah. Um, so I would say like all of our like primitive transfer operations, it's usually like a quantum of heating, a quantum of heating or less. And so like during the rearrangement, um, we're always Doppler cooling. So I feel like as long as we keep it below Doppler temperature, um, that's fine. Uh, and then the, the heating rate, yeah, I mean, it's like affected by obviously like a number of things. I think one of the main things is um, electronic noise on the electrodes. Um, but yeah, like I don't know I'm probably not allowed to like go and tell people what our heating rate is, but it's um, not really a problem. I can say I can say that, and I can also say like um, as long as uh, you know stuff doesn't heat up, um, you know, significantly during gating, um, it's not really yeah, it's not really a big deal. Cool. Yeah, it's also a question about uh, if the transitions, if the, if the ion transitions are optical. And, and they're optical. Mm -hmm. But there's also yeah. people working with microwave, no? Oh. Right, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so our two qubit states, they're the two, two hyperfine states in um, euterbium. So um, they are separated by um, a microwave frequency transition. So you can drive that tr transition with microwaves. Um, 
the the only problem, I mean, and there's there's ways around this, and I, I know like people at NIST down the road in Boulder are working on it. Um, but like microwave generally, you know, the wavelength is like very long. Um, and so if you like, you know, there's obviously ways around this, but generally um, if you apply a microwave, um, you know, to, to your ions, like you, you're gonna apply the microwave to all of them. And so um, for, for us to drive that transition, we usually wanna be able to like, just shine a laser at one ion and be like, okay, I'm talking to you. I don't wanna talk um, to the rest of the ions. For example, so we, um, yeah, we usually drive those transitions with two laser beams, where the difference frequency between the two laser colors is a microwave frequency, and so that's how we're able to kind of like, yes, it is a microwave frequency transition, um, but it's easier for us, at least right now, to like address individual ions um, with like sort of a two photon Raman transition. See. Good questions. I feel like none of those askers were like college freshmen. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway, um, thanks for coming, uh, regardless. And um, yeah, I think now's a good time probably to talk a little bit more about my career path and um, you know other discussion. So I drew this cartoon of like what I think maybe a successful career trajectory would look like. Um, you know, I think it's okay to be lost sometimes. It's okay to like take some wrong turns, right? Um, you know, you can have like really bad things happen, but like, as long as you have friends, um, that's usually helpful. And I, I like totally think it's a good idea. Like, you know, go try, try random new things and then you can always come back and do what you're more used to. And like, I've probably done, you know, all of the above. Um, and I would say like the only thing I would recommend, right? Like, I don't think there's any like perfect linear career trajectory, but like generally when I've like, gone into positions where I've been like, I think a little less engaged and a little less stoked to like work really hard. I usually try to like try something else at that point. Um, so here's our dog when she's a puppy, her name is Mushroom. Um, so when I was an early undergrad, like, you know, I started off working in an electrical engineering lab where I was like just soldering. I didn't really know what I was doing. Like I was just like assembling whatever the grad student told me to do. That was good, it's good to get hands on. Um, experience. Then I worked in a particle physics lab and I just like really didn't get very much done there. Um, and then I did an RU where I like started to find my stride to some degree. And I think like for, yeah, for people in the audience, um, you know, especially if you go to a smaller university, I think these like RU's research experience for undergrads, you can apply for them all over the world. Um, that's a good, good opportunity to like go somewhere else for the summer. Um, you get paid, uh, and yeah, it's a good opportunity, especially if you don't have a really strong uh, research program at your um, home university, or maybe it's like more of a liberal liberal arts school or whatever. Uh, it's a good opportunity to go to a big research institution and like get your hands dirty. Um, I did fail a quantum mechanics midterm once, and they still let me talk to freshmen at UCLA. So like, you know, you can fail a few tests, you'll be fine. Like, you know, I recommend uh, not staying up all night. Um, before midterms, like it's hard to do math when you don't sleep. Um, so like my, my, I think my main advice would be like, don't pull all matters, like get your sleep, like be healthy, exercise, eat vegetables. I don't know. That's, that's what I would have told, told my former, my former self for sure. Um, and then, yeah, then I like, uh, you know, started working in this uh, uh, ultra cold atom lab. So this is like, still like a experimental atomic physics. I'm still like, shining lasers at atoms, um, playing around with them. And that, that I was like really excited to work pretty hard on because it's like so much more uh, sort of interactive. Everything's right on your table. Um, it's really fun to like build lasers and then like shoot them at things. Um, so yeah, there's my dog. She's all grown up now. Um, and so just looking at this list of undergrads who I used to work with, um, you know, what can you do with an undergrad degree? Uh, in physics, well, you could join the circus. Jacob, um, really great physicist. He's still, yeah, he's still in the circus. Um, <laughs> Kevin, he did, he did his PhD in um, experimental atomic physics, uh, but that now he's actually working at a startup um, that's combining AI with radiology. So you can like, you know, it, it just gives you like a bunch of really broad technical skills and you can kind of go 
anywhere with it after your PhD. And then it's cute. Uh, me and Caroline, we're actually now back together uh, on the same team, even at Quantinium. And yeah, we got to start doing atomic physics like way back in the day. She looks very young and fit. Um, and like I asked her for a good, good quote for, for this photo. And she said, I'm surrounded by equipment and I have no idea what any of it does. And that's, yeah, also a super common way to feel when you like show up in any new lab. So, you know, just, just show up and ask questions. I think would be my advice. Uh, so yeah, I thought that was really fun. Um, so I decided I wanted to do my PhD uh, working on an atomic clock based on neutral atoms. And so I ripped down the whole old experiment and I rebuilt a new experiment where you could trap um, one ion per site in this three-dimensional crystal. Um, and that was good for atomic clocks and uh, just, Shout out to my team. Yeah, every time our advisor uh, took a promotional photo, we always like made fun of him and took our own. Um, yeah, and here's some photos about like what this looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. You can wrap things in aluminum foil if that's your thing. Um, that's to, to bake out our vacuum chamber. So um, we heat, heat up the whole thing to get the, and vacuum out all the water that like sticks on surfaces. Um, you can spray things with helium. Uh, align lasers. So yeah, in these labs, you'll see like there's a gajillion mirrors. All the mirrors have knobs on them. Um, you can check this up. If you're into high fashion clothing and want to wear a bunny suit, you can do that. Um, so especially for like handling sensitive optics, um, I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we sometimes wear bunny suits. Um, if you like designing and building circuits, you, you kind of get to do everything, really. Um, and I think, you know, my day-to-day -day life um, at Quantinium, is very similar, except it's a, it's a larger scale effort, obviously. Um, it's more collective. We all really like, there's like hundreds of us and we all have the same goal. And I get to work with um, engineers more, which is actually really helpful. Um, you know, I, I still interact with them and like look at the circuit diagrams and stuff, but it's like great to have experts to be able to consult. And like, yeah, not everything goes to plan. Like, you know, here's a, figure from my thesis where the caption is like, you know, spectrophotometer measurement illustrating the decline of American manufacturing. Um, so like, yeah, like, you know, either you'll design and build a piece of hardware, it won't work as anticipated, or you'll get something shipped from a company, and it won't work, um, you know, happens all the time. I think you just gotta be flexible. And like, even if not everything works out, like you gotta be like, oh, well, can I get something useful out of this? Or can we like, change our plans or whatever. So um, yeah, we finally got it, got it worked out. It's kind of a journey, um, especially those like, yeah, our viewport coatings like all failed. Um, but, but we got it together eventually. And I'm very proud that I, I published this paper and uh, got our dog, Hannah Johnson, um, to be listed in the uh, acknowledgements for, for my like sort of PhD paper. Um, then I did a postdoc at Berkeley, which was pretty cool. Um, I, yeah, I can chat more about that, um, you know, after. Um, but uh, since I'm a little short on time and I want to save time for questions, yeah, I'll say like, I think everyone hits a lot of bumps on along the way, um, career-wise, during your PhD, et cetera. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people like, like a, my main message is that like, you know, whatever you have going on in your life, like I feel like you're probably not alone, um, but people don't always talk about um, these things at work. So I'll share, I have super bad ADHD. Like I'm, I'm a huge space cadet. Like I'm better with medication, but like I can't remember anything. And so I have to write everything on my hand. Um, and like sometimes I sleep with my hand, face on my hand. And then I wake up in the morning and like, you know, my face is also telling me uh, to remember to go to the bank or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Like I also have like endometriosis. So like I'm in pain a lot of the time. Um, you know, my dad, overdosed on opioids like during my final year of my PhD and that was kind of uh yeah I was just like a train wreck for a while um but you know like my friends are really supportive they're supportive of the fact that like oh my brain wasn't quite working for a little bit and like I got it together eventually and I think like you know I definitely persevered through all that but like with a lot of help and yeah I think I, I hear from them the students they think like oh maybe like everyone's lives are just all you know, perfect and they're the only ones dealing with like this or that. But I think it's more like people just don't 
always talk about these things, but um, yeah, it's always good to reach out for help um, when you need it. People were really great to me. And so yeah, finally, here's just a smattering of my grad school friends. Like you can see a lot of us all ended up at Quantinium, but like, you know, my friend's wife, she I got her PC in astronomy. Um, she's an astronomer with the National Park Service now. Like Nico here is in science policy, so he's working in DC wearing suits all day. Um, you know, Michelle does data science, Liz does medical imaging. Um, you know, Kathy here did uh she did science communication, but now she's like a full-blown comedian and she's actually in LA. So y'all should go see her. Here's her, here's her website. Um, she, yeah, she's hilarious. Uh, yeah, so you could even like be a comedian or join the circus. There's a lot of different career paths. Um, so finally, yeah, lots of different contribution opportunities here. Also, if um, people from academia would like to submit proposals for access to our machines, um, there's this program through Oak Grove National Lab and also this Azure Quantum Credits program from Microsoft. So feel free to submit proposals and that's how you can get some, um, you know, free free machine time. Um, I would like to thank the CAS uh, for, for uh, taking silly videos. And yeah, finally, I'll have some time for, for more questions. So thank you. So why don't we all unmute ourselves and just clap, try to do like a more than one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah is extraordinary. So I'm so, so happy that you're here with us. So um, why don't we open for questions? If you have a question, please, if you're comfortable with that, just unmute yourself and, and ask questions so that we can keep it personal. Thank you so much, Sarah. You're awesome. Questions? Okay, I have uh, I have uh, three questions for the first part and one question for the second part. The first three question might be too, you know, you know, forgive me if it's too basic and too fundamental. Um, the first one is, uh, well, that uh, three question is on the iron trap. Um, when you mention individual trapped iron, are you those, trapped iron are you talking about uh, the excited you know you you one of the slides you mentioned uh, you know you show that 171 ytterbium positive charge nuclear and uh, layer one zero and when laser sh shined come to layer one that's uh, from zero to one excited to one so those but when you mention individual trapped iron those Trapped iron, are you referred to those excited electron from zero to one? Um, yeah, I actually when I talk about trapped iron, I'm like referring to the whole the whole ion, I guess. Yeah. And that's actually the the neat thing. I, the thing that I really like about ions is like because they're charged, uh, it doesn't matter what their internal state is. So it doesn't matter if they're a zero or a one um, or like, you know, whatever um, is happening with them electronically. Cause like at the end of the day, they're charged. So you have like positively charged, you know, they're, they're just always positively charged. Um, and so we trap them using uh, electric fields. And so they wanna go basically to the electric field minimum. And so if you think like maybe I apply, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but like, um, yeah, if I apply a negative voltage on this electrode here, the ion is gonna wanna like hover above the negative voltages basically. So yeah, it's a, the whole ion trapping is like independent of um, whether the ion's a zero or a one. So if it is the entire ion, you are talking about it still is an electron, not the 171 ytterbium positive charge nucleus, right? Um, I'm talking about like the whole, yeah, the whole atom. Um, oh, atom, including nuclear and including, electron. Yeah, yeah, including that. So I'm talking about ytterbium 171 plus. So it's okay. the whole thing. We take an electron off really early um, before we trap it. Um, and then the whole time, yeah, it's the entire atom, like the nucleus, all, all the electrons are all moving around. Yeah. If it is entire, when you apply DC electrode, how you control the direction, how they move around? 
if this yeah. one sum is positive charge, some is negative charge, then the moving direction will be different on the DC electrode. Oh, you're, are you saying like because some parts of the atom are positive and some are negative, you think they might go? Yeah. Different directions. Yeah, I think it's because um, like let's see, the electrons are like are bound to the nucleus with a much larger force than in than any of these like smaller fields that we're using to move the entire um, atom around. Uh, so yeah, it, it kind of takes a, it takes a pretty high electric field to be able to like ionize or like to be able to like, you know, rip off electrons or like move the uh, electrons in the nucleus in different directions. We just generally don't do that. So, um, you know, with a, with a ion, like, so, you know, it's positively charged. If you look at the atom from far enough away, um, you don't really notice like that it's made out of protons and neutrons and electrons or whatever. You look at it from pretty far away and it just kind of looks like a ball that's positively charged. Um, so for the purposes of all this shuttling and transport, I think you can just think of it as, you know, a perfect sphere or whatever you like um, that is just positively charged. And it, it all stays, it all stays together. Yeah, none of the fields during the transport are enough to be like ripping electrons off or anything like that. A uh, second question to your first part. Uh, oh, okay, go in, ahead. In the, in the interest of time, maybe uh, sure. we should ask other people to ask questions. Sure, maybe sure, sure. someone, Absolutely. A, a freshman from UCLA, come on. There, there's over 30 of you here, come on. Yeah, yeah, I always have freshman questions. I feel like I got a lot of very pointed questions on our like coherence side. <laughs> We're freshmen. Yeah, I think they're afraid of you. Oh no, I, I was oh. going to be not scary, but. <laughs> Come on, freshman. Excuse me, may I? Uh, sorry, I'm not a freshman, but I'm a fresh postdoc in ECE department. So, <laughs> <maybe I could. laughs> uh, yeah, so Sarah, thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction and uh, sharing your thoughts on this. So, I was just wondering in the, perhaps a basic point. So, when you have, say, two trapped ions and you, you, you're saying you can move them around and bring them together and separate them apart. So, uh, would you be effectively measuring them when you are moving them because then in that case if you actually if this kind of movement is equivalent to measurement then essentially they will lose the uh the the the, the quantum uh, nature right so yeah that's a good question um so i would say um so during during gating uh like while we're doing a gate um you know, the electronic states and the emotional states uh, are coupled. So that is true. So like the motion is coupled with like, you know, if the qubits is zero or one or whatever, but once we've, that, that only happens for the duration of the gate though. And once we're done with the gate, um, the ions motion is completely um, separate from their electronic state. So it's like, you know, totally decoupled. So that's why we're, yeah, we're able to like, we store all the quantum information in the electronic states. And, um, you know, as, as, long, as, as soon as the gate's over, they can just go on their separate ways. And it, right. the, um, yeah, the motion doesn't really affect um, any of the quantum information. I see, interesting. Uh, so perhaps that's kind of related. Uh, in the case, you, when you bring them together with, in your quantum circuit, at some point you want to actually differentiate your QB one and two and perform some operation only in two, for example. But I was wondering when you bring them together and separate apart, can you still target the two as the two, for example? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is another thing that kind of confused me because my, you know, my PhD research, obviously like I had a degenerate Fermi gas. And so like, you know, all the all the atoms <laughs> are so close together, they're they're all indis like fundamentally indistinguishable, right? And they like follow Fermi statistics. Mm -hmm. Um, but for us. Yeah, because the ions, I think, like, because they're charged, they're never, like, that close together, I would say. And if, if you bring one in from the left, and you bring a different uh -huh. one in from the right, like, that order is actually going to stay preserved. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, so, like, we can really, 
like, yeah, we're, we're doing like superpositions of like um, electronic states and we're entangling the ions, but um, I feel like all the ions are sort of like, they're basically distinguishable like in, in a quantum sense. Yeah. Mm, I see, I see, interesting, thank you. Sarah, there's a question in the chat. What do you suggest to a graduate student who does not know where they belong, industry or academia, or uh, I would add entrepreneurship or government or nonprofit? Yeah, I mean, I think one option is you could just, you know, just try stuff until you find somewhere you belong. I think that's that's probably pretty pretty reasonable. Um, and like, you know, you can do a few years here, a few years there, like see what you like. Um, also, if your PhD lab is open to it and it like fits in with your timing and stuff, um, you can always do an internship too. You can try an internship at a startup. You could try an internship, you know, with us or whatever. We we hire interns every summer. I know we're hiring. Actually, my friend's gonna work with us um this summer. I'm um, pretty sure. And like, so he, yeah, he just finished all of his research. He just has to write his thesis, and like, that was a good time for him to just come in and explore and see um what he likes. But yeah, I think a lot of this is like, you don't really know um how much you're gonna like it or like all these things until you just like try. One final question to Sarah. May I ask a question also like, uh, so you are working at Quantinome and I'm actually surprised like now most of the ion trapping experiments are going to be commercialized and they are going like they are having uh, optically integrated systems and they are uh, scaling it, like thinking of large scales of this kind of quantum computers. But why do you at quantum at continuum it seems that you are still at laboratory level and why it is that why is that yeah i mean um yeah if you know someone who's like actually you know demonstrated good uh you know computer performance with an integrated system i'd definitely be like curious i mean we're obviously um you know i think uh the commercial systems uh we've launched so far um you know, uh, anyway, I would say, yeah, I would say there's, there's like a lot of R&D efforts uh, going on that we um, maybe don't present uh, on publicly. Um, but yeah, I think my, my response would just be like, stay, stay tuned or whatever. I have one question just because I'm very curious, right? So yeah. are, are people, around you in your in your milieu there are, are people starting to talk about the societal implications of having a quantum computer around is it is it stuff that you in the industry are you starting to to talk about because in academia i don't think there is a lot of people talking about like quantum in conjunction with policy and stuff and i'm, I'm super interested and i think there's a big vacuum of yeah yeah i think um you know, it, it would take quite a quantum computer to be able to like break RSA encryption and you know stuff like that. Like you know, really cause the whole world to like really change. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I would say like right now it's definitely much more at a stage where, as far as societal implications go, like I'm just like thrilled that like somebody might want to use it um, to do like you know molecular dynamics simulations for like drug discovery or whatever in the near term-ish future. Um, like I think right, right now, like there's probably, I mean, maybe we should think more about, um, you know, the bigger picture and obviously like I'm just one, you know, one lab rat, right? Like who doesn't, I don't really speak for the entire company, but like I would say for me personally, like, yeah, I'm more, I'm like mostly just excited about all the like difficult problems that like, perhaps my computer could help solve such as like battery simulations and like, um, you know, drug development, like quantum chemistry applications. Um, Sarah, you're an exceptional leverage. You, uh, uh -huh. I, I, I'm such a big fan. So thank you uh -huh. for being here. Shall we, shall we close? I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Could I, could I ask a remaining question or, or Sarah and I can connect 
uh, after with, uh, after this? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Okay. Let's, let's, okay. Okay. I, I, I don't know if, maybe Sarah has a meeting she has to go to. No. Or, or no. Oh, eventually I can show up a little late there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, you mentioned when those um, could be tangled when laser shine. So you know, at the end of the day, you shine the laser on them, and then if they are tangled, they are glow. Do you know what's the reason why at that moment when tangled, then, you know, laser will glow? Oh, yeah. Um, actually, uh, so what I was like, trying to say was like, yeah, depending on, um, you know, whether they're in like the zero or the one state or whatever, um, uh, you know, they'll either be bright or dark and then we'll pump them into the other state. And again, they'll either be bright or dark and then we measure again. So we're where I'm saying like, yeah, they either glow or don't glow, we're, we're actually detecting on, um, that actually doesn't really have anything to do with entanglement, but it just ha happens to do with like, at the end of the day, whether um, whether the qubit is a zero or a one. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> okay, the last question is about what you mentioned about you are working on uh, uh, atom clock on, on the crystal. Is that the crystal is like, uh, are you, uh, what kind of crystal were you using? Yeah, um, so it's actually a three-dimensional optical lattice. So I have uh, three la three laser beams that come in, and then they get retro reflected. So it's like a three-dimensional um, standing wave of light um, where the atoms like to sit at the anti-nodes um, of the standing waves. So. Uh, Material-wise, what kind of um, crystal is like a diamond material, like nitrogen? Uh, it's just yeah, it's actually just made out of laser light. So yeah, it's it's uh, we with the neutral atoms actually. So this is all you know based on neutral atoms. Um, with the neutral atoms, they act we like actually just trap them um, in laser light, and uh, you know it's just kind of like dipole trapping. So um, the the atoms get attracted to the area of maximum laser intensity. So yeah, just think of it as laser light and literally like just one atom per site. Okay, and last question yeah. might take a maybe a longer is regarding uh, one of slide you show R1, R2, you know, that resistance, I assume that is a control design. And also a vacuum was applied, uh, but that may take a longer time to, to, to discuss, but we can talk some other time. Thank you. Dr. Sure, yeah. yeah, feel free to send me an email. I don't have your email address, sorry. Oh yeah, um, sorry, I'll flash it up. Um, yeah, if you, there, I can also. Go. I can put it in the chat too. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, Sarah, thank you so very much for yeah. coming talk to, to, to our freshmen and, and friends. Um, <laughs> Thank you for, for your time, for your openness, and like it, 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 it's a big, big pleasure to have you here. And looking forward to, to having like to having you here again because I, I think you give a great talk to, to like about ion trap. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe. Thank you. Oh, huh. uh, yeah, it's a great talk. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. It's great talk. Thank you. Have a nice day there. And yeah. thanks for, for, for giving your time to us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.